Hello and welcome to this next video on OCR A-Level Biology. This is module 6.1 which is Cellular Control. Now before we get into this module, I need we need to just quickly go over DNA. So here we have a quick review of the DNA molecule. So let's label this molecule and see what we can do. Okay, so here this yellow line that we can see here. This is the sugar phosphate backbone. So that contains the um, the ribo, the deoxyribo sugar, and the phosphate group. So here, this is the deoxyribo sugar, and then this here is the phosphate group. So that's deoxyribose and that's phosphate and they make up the sugar phosphate backbone. Within, the, in between, so you have hydrogen bonds here in between which are joining up these bases. So all nucleotides have one a unique base so, and these bases form pairs. So this one base pair here and then here's another base pair. Now here, the base pairs, the bases, each base pairs with another base and w certain bases pair, always pair up with each other due to the number of hydrogen bonds that they form. So A, the base pair A, adenine, always pairs with the base pair thymine. And this is for, I think it is, it says here, one second. So the base pair adenine always pairs with the base pair thymine, and the base pair cytosine pairs with the base pair guanine. Yep, so adenine pairs with thymine, and these make two hydrogen bonds. And C, cytosine, makes three hydrogen bonds with G, guanine. Now, if you put one deoxyribose sugar, one phosphate group, and one of these nuclear, one of these bases, you get here one nucleotide. So this is one nucleotide, and that's the. And we also, and one more thing we need to know, mention is that DNA, the D, both strands of the DNA, are anti-parallel. Let me just move this out of the way. So they're anti-parallel, which means that one strand, this strand, it runs in diff they both run in different directions. So this strand runs in the five prime to three prime direction, and then this strand on the other side, I'm not using dark blue, and this strand on the other side runs in the three prime to five prime direction. Just one more short thing to mention, this phosphate group, this has a negative charge, so the PO4 minus, so PO4 minus, it has a negative charge. So let's go to, now we talk about DNA, let's talk about cellular control, so how the cell, how genes are regulated. So for this book, you need your second year test. And let me just move the stuff out of the way. And let me just find the correct page. <laughs> so we're on page. So here. And oh, it says here that we're talking about gene mutations. But anyway, let's go to here first. So I don't need you, I need you. Here we have a cell. So all DNA, as we know, is contained within the nucleus. So all DNA we know is contained within the nucleus. And, nu and in the nucleus, our DNA is tightly packed around histone proteins. And we're going to branch off slightly to do pre-transcriptional. -trans pre this is before transcription can even occur. So 
This is how it's regulated to either activate the gene or deactivate the gene. So, here we have, we're going to talk about epigenetics. So here we're going to talk about the eukaryotic version first. So, and that eukaryotic version is epigenetics. Now there are certain things. So either the gene, so the gene function can be changed. So it can either be expressed or not expressed based on epigenetic factors. And there are different types of epigenetic factors. Epi means above, and then genetic is to do with the genome. So the word technically means above genome. So these are mar these are markers which work on the DNA and either express, make it more loose for transcription to occur, or make it more tightly packed for so transcription is prevented. So one example is using methyl groups so methylation so methylation prevents transcription and demethylation no methylation means promote it promotes transmission So I'm going to just branch off here. No, I don't. So I'm just going to branch off here and talk about, so here we have a DNA monogram. So here's one strand and here's the other strand. And here we have the genes. So here, let's do A. I'm going to just do it as it is. So A, C. So this is just one gene. I'm not going to use that. There is one gene. So let's say this is a gene within our DNA molecule. There's these little things called epigenetic markers and with an and called methyl groups. And basically a methyl group can be added here and here and this what these do is that these prevent transcription so that means that this gene from this methyl group to this methyl group is not actively transcribe it's really hard to write sideways but i just managed to do it so that's a methylation there's also histone methylation so histone methylation so histones are proteins in which the dna is wound around and histone methylation also prevents transcription and demethylation promotes transcription but you don't just get histone methylation we have histone acetylation as well. So histone acetylation. So histone acetylation. Of hist so this is acetylation of histones. And if you have histone acetylation, you promote transcription. But if you have histone deacetylation, you prevent transcription. So, in, um, actually, you can have a gene which was methylated at first and not, and then if, if preventing transcription, you have it methylated, one certain gene, and then if you want to promote transcription of the gene, you just remove the methyl group and add on an acetyl group onto the histones if it's wound, wound around the if that gene is wound around histones to promote the transcription. And then if you don't want 
and they've scanned any of you want to prevent transcription, remove the acetyl group from the histone, and then add in a methyl group. So these two can be used together to either prevent or promote transcription. So this is in eukaryotes. But what about prokaryotes? So to do that, we need to go and look at a specific case study in prokaryotes. Actually, I finished down there, isn't it? On how transcription is regulated. And yeah, this is it. So this is a case study which is in E. coli, E. coli bacteria cells. So here we have E. coli, this is E. coli. And it's a bacterial cell that contains a certain septinoxine called an opero. So an opero is a group of genes that function as a single transcription unit and this was first identified in these bacterial prokaryotic cells. So here, this is a specific operon called the LAP operon. So let's, let's just go through this one. And this is all to do with producing two enzymes. So here, LACZ and LACY, these genes are for producing the two enzymes. So LACZ, produces, I think, black Z produces one enzyme. So I think this one would be lactose permease. There's black Z, lactose permease enzyme. Permease. And then the lac Y gene does the beta galactosidase. which breaks down a sugar called lactose into glucose and beta-galactose so that the cell, the bacteria cell, can use it in respiration. Now, in front of these two genes, we have something called an operon. Operon, an operator. So O here is the operator. Like Z, I should have written it here. <laughs> Like Z is the um, lactose permease, lactose permease. And then like Y is the beta, gal beta galactosidase. It's the shortening. And now this one, this is the promoter region. So this is promotion. This is the promoter region. And then like I, as you can see here, this is the regulatory gene. So basically it codes for a specific protein called a repressor protein. It codes for a specific protein, which is here, shown in grey, called the repressor protein. And I can't spell today for some reason. I did not mean to do that. Repressor. So this is the repressor protein. Now, when you, there is no lactose person, you don't want the bacteria still making loads and loads and loads of the lactose permeates and the beta galactosidase because you're just wasting resources. So what you do is when there's no lactose present, this repressor protein will bind to the operator. So it's coded here by RNA polymerase. The repressor protein is bound, binds to the operator region. And what that does is it prevents RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter region. But when, so this is without lactose. So this is without, without lactose. However, when lactose is present, as you can see here, this molecule is lactose. And when it binds to the repressor protein, this is RNA pol. Oh no, this is the ribosome. 
sorry, 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 sorry. This is the ribosome. This is the ribosome here. So this here is the ribosome. I did not mean to write it there. This is the ribosome. So this is the ribosome. And this is the lactose sugar. It binds to the repressor protein. So here we have lactose bound to repressor protein. And that means that the repressor protein has a change in shape and that moves it away from the operator region. So that means now that RNA pol can bind to the promoter and start transcription of the LAC Z and LAC Y gene. Therefore, we have an mRNA here, which can be made into lactose permease. Permease and beta galactosidase. Sidase. And those two can be used to break down the lactose molecule. So in effect, the lactose is causing its own fate. Is what's, that's what's happening here. The lactose decides whether it wants to accept its fate or not. <laughs> Which is a little bit weird. <laughs> but there you go. So this is a, so that was in prokaryotes in E. coli bacterial cells. Now this is just an extra diagram showing about what happens with what we just talked about before with epigenetics. So here we have cytosine. So this is an example of a methyl group being added. So this is an example of methylation. So cytosine can become 5-methylcytosine and that me those methyl groups can cause and prevent transcription in eukaryotic cells. And also here, we have histone acetylation. Which means that when you add an acetyl group to a histone protein, then, then I need to double, I need to fat set this. So this is a histone optima, where if with the histone tails here, is the histone tails which are acetylated to promote transcription. As you can see, it's on your textbook on a page, whatever this page, 173. There's a detailed explanation because I don't think you'll be able to read that. Okay, now we're going back to active to look at gene mutations. So here we have all different types of mutations that we need to be aware of. So here, just on this side, this is a codon chart. So here we have the first position, second position, and the third position in a codon. So in the first position, if I want to code, if I need to find a codon, if I want to work out what amino acid the codon, uh, for example, if I want to work out what amino acid the codon T, uh, T, T, for example, T, 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 for example, I want to work out what amino acid codes does this code for. So I look at the first letter, which is T. So I'm going to look at the first letter, T. So first position, you have a T here. Now I'm going to look at this second. This is a really random one. Now I'm going to look at the second position. Oh look, the second position is a T. So I look here at the second position and see that there is a T here. And then I go to the third position, the third letter in the codon, which is also a T. I know it's a bit of a random one, but there you go. That's and then I just read off what it gives me. So T, 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 that gives me PHE, which I can't read on there, but it says here phenylalanine. So this will give me phenylalanine. 
TTT. Now, as you can see here, there are multiple codons for one amino acid, which pertains to the first type of mutation that we're going to talk about here, which is a silent mutation. So a silent mutation. I don't know if you can keep hearing me, if you hear me, but it should be working. So silent mutation. If you can't hear me, then let me know in the comments and I'll try and make the audio improve for next time. Sorry. <laughs> so a silent mutation is where one amino acid is changed, one, even though one codon is changed. So here, it's not really shown properly here. But here we have, where is it? This one, this is the silent mutation. So the silent mutation is not this one. It's this one down here. Sorry, this is the second, this is the silent mutation here. So this is the silent mutation. So when one co one base is changed, so here we have alanine to guanine. Alanine to guanine. We can see it still codes for the same amino acid. So here we have TTA, which codes for leucine. If we change that A and put a G in there instead, we can see by looking at our codon chart, that T, T, G still codes for leucine. So it's the same, so this is a silent mutation. And these are normally, these are normally, have, they have no effect. So they have no effect on amino acid. As you can see here. Because, as I said, multiple codons, there can be multiple codons for one amino acid with the exception for methionine. But methionine is normally the start to the first pro the, uh, the first amino acid in your protein chain. So there's only one for it. But that aside, you can see apart from methionine, every other amino acid has more than one codon. So there's like what, 64 different codons? But there's only 20 amino acids that we have in in that we have in the human body. So yeah, here we have TTA, change that to TTG, it still codes for the same amino acid. There is no effect on the protein structure at all. So the primary structure is not affected, so, and therefore all the other levels of structure that we talked about, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, whatever the level of structure of protein, that's not affected. Now, the second one, which is, I can't remember which one, it's a top one. The second one, it's not the top, is it the top one? Yeah, it's the top one. The second one, which is the top one, is called a missing mutation. And a missense mutation is it changes one amino acid. We have a change in amino acid. So you can see in this example that we have here, it's TTA. This is supposed to be TTA. So we have TTA and that codes for leucine. Now, in the previous one, we have here TTA changing to TTG. This time, we have TTA changing to, let me get a different color, TCA. And you can see here that that goes for serine instead of leucine. So we have a change in the amino acid. And because we have a change in the amino acid, that can cause a change to both the primary structure and the secondary structure, but also the tertiary and even quaternary structure of the protein. So an example of this would be um, a sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is a good is a brilliant example of this sickle cell 
disease, so sickle cell anemia, where the mutation for hemoglobin, there's a mutation in the gene that goes for one of the globin, one of the proteins in polypeptide change in hemoglobin. So in this one, it's the cis base triplet for of the gene for the beta polypeptide for the beta polypeptide change, the amino acid in valine, which is normally the amino acid there. Instead, which is the okay. So let me start again. So in sickle cell disease, you have glutamic acid, which is the normal protein, normal amino acid, in the cis base triplet for the beta polypeptide chain in hemoglobin. Instead, you have valine, which is inserted at the same position as the glutamic acid. So we have a substitution. So glutamic acid is being substituted for by valine. It's being substituted by valine. So this, likewise here, the amino acid leucine is being substituted by serine. So that's a missense mutation. There's also nonsense mutations, nonsense mutations. And that changes, so that changes to make a stop codon. Now a stop codon, you can probably see in the table here, that there are three codons that code for stop. And stop means end protein synthesis, end the, that's the end of the protein. So here we have the same amino acid here. So let's do T, T, A, that codes for leucine. Instead, if we change it to T, A, A, which you can see here, T, A, A, that codes for stop. And that means that the protein stops there. So this, so these other amino acids won't be added on. So the CTC amino acid, the AAT, and the CC triple C amino acids, they won't be added on. This can normally result in a truncated protein, which means the protein becomes too short and it basically can't function when it's too short. Now, this one's a very dangerous, these are quite dangerous, but not very dangerous. So the genetic, an example of this is the genetic disease, Dutch and muscular dystrophy, and that is the result of a nonsense mutation. So Dutch and muscular dystrophy, and that is the result of a nonsense mutation resulting in a truncated protein, which then leads to DPD, DMD. I'm just going to call it that, that's a muscular dystrophy. Now, the last one, and this is one of the, this is probably the most dangerous one of all, is an indel or insertion or frame shift mutation. So if nucleotide-based pairs, which are not in the multiple of three, are inserted or deleted from the gene, and because the code is non-overlapping, and is read in groups of threes, then all the subsequent base triplets are altered. And this is known as a frame shift mutation. So it can be called by insertion, Slash or deletion. And then the mean and then this and then everything affects everything after. Everything after the mutation. So what do I mean by that? I mean here that here we have T T A and that code for leucine. But instead, we've removed a T. So here we have T-A-C. 
So the T is still there, the first T is still there, but now we have an AC. And then here we have a GCA, an ADC, and a, what's next, a CC with a dash in the middle, a CC dash. And that means that here, because we've removed that timing, we've now completely changed the order of amino acid. So up to about here, it's normal, everything's the same. But then here on downstream, all the protein, all the amino acids have changed. And that could either benefit, it could benefit the protein, it could make the protein more suitable to its function, which is very unlikely, but it could. But normally this means that the protein just loses its function. And if it's severely very abnormal to protein, then it will just be gone. It will just be broken, degraded quickly like that within the cell. So that's a frame shift mutation. So those are the four main types of mutations that we need to be aware of. But there's also others. So expanding nucleotide, triple nucleotide, whatever you want to call it. I'm just going to read off the textbook here. So some genes contain a repeating triplet, such as the example they give here is CAG, CAG, CAG. So Huntington disease, which is also a genetic disease, results from a results from an expanding triple nucleotide repeat. If the number of repeating CAG sequences goes above a certain critical number, then the person with that genotype will develop Huntington disease. And basically, in expanding nucleotide triple repeat, the number of CAG triplets increases at meiosis, and again, from generation to generation. So these, so there are these mutations called triple nucleotide repeats, which can be very bad. But not all mutations are very harmful. So some mutations are beneficial, 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 beneficial. <laughs> and they have helped to drive evolution through natural selection. We talked about uh, the theory of evolution back in module four, but in way back in module four about classification and evolution. So the mutates. So for example, early in humans in Africa would have had black skin, and this is because the high there's high concentrations of melanin produced protecting them from sunburn and skin cancer. When humans migrated to temp temperate regions, such as here in the UK, a paler skin would be an, at an advantage because it enables vitamin D to be made with a lo very low intensity of sunlight. So in such areas, people with fairer skin would have an advantage and be selected, as vitamin D not only protects them from rickets, they also protect humans from heart disease and cancer. So people with intemperate areas, such as here in the UK, people with paler skin would be at an advantage. But in Africa, people with black skin would have an advantage due to higher concentrations of melanin. But some mutations appear to be neutral, either being so they're not beneficial or they're not harmful. So there's some random ones that occur in humans, such as differently shaped earlobes, so whether they're attached or or like overhanging, like not attached or attached earlobes, or the inability to smell different flowers, or a good one is the inability, the ability to taste. I don't know what it's called, but it's the ability to taste some paper, which is very, which tastes very sour for some people. But other people can't taste it. I don't know what that paper is called, but I've heard about it. And also, there's the ability to see if your thumb bends backwards if you do a thumbs up. So, me, for instance, have that. I think has that. I think I have that mutation where, if you have a your thumb when you do a thumbs up, sometimes for some people the thumb curves backwards on itself. 
so I have that mutation bunny where it curves backwards. But some people they just have a straight thumb when they do the thumbs up or thumbs down sign. Again, that's neither beneficial or harmful, but it's just random. It's a random occurrence within the human population. Anyway, back to this. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on down to chromosome mutations. So now we're going to move to chromosome. So now we're going to let's go back up to here. Now that we talked about mutations, and let's go back to here. So now we're going to go back to regulation of transcription. So here, I know this is a very weird order, but I'd rather talk about the mutations first because they're interesting. So here, this is regulation of transcription. So this is, so here we have transcription happening. We have the mRNA being made. So this green bit here is mRNA. This bit here is the RNA polymerase. Now there is post-transcriptional gene regulation as well. So this is now we're talking about post-transcription. So if I move to the side here, so if I move to the side here, then we're going to go to post-transcription Post transcription. And then here we're going to talk about splicing, specifically splicing. So, what is splicing? Well, first, to understand splicing, we need to understand that the mRNA that is directly made from RNA pile is known what's pre mRNA, so it's not ready to go straight away. It's not ready to leave the nucleus straight away. There are a few edits that need to be made. One of those edits is splicing. I don't know why it said splashing there. It should be splicing. Okay, but anyways, splicing is when introns are removed from pre mRNA. So here, introns are removed. So in this one, introns are removed. So introns are basically non-code inceptions of DNA within a gene. And these introns are not expressed. And they separate the coding regions or exons. So all the DNA in within a gene, both introns and exons, are transcribed but it's only the exons which are the important parts. So what you do is you have something called the spliceosome, which is, you don't need to know in any detail other than there's something called the spliceosome. There's something called the spliceosome. Remove, which removes introns. And then what you have here, so this is a diagram here, saying that the spliceosome will just remove that intron, and then that intron, and then that intron, and then that intron. So you remove these introns, and then you stick all, and then you stick all the exons together. And that is where you get something called mature mRNA. So the resulting mRNA is called, so this resulting mRNA here is called the primary mRNA. So this is called primary mRNA. And this is, as it says here, mature mRNA. So, yeah, that's basically it. So the remaining mRNA exons correspond to the DNA exons. So they had to remain in the order that they were transcribed. They are stuck together. So exons are stuck together. To 
together and this forms mature mRNA so that when the axons are stuck together they form mature mRNA and that can then leave the nucleus and then head off to a ribosome so this is post transcription no regulation We also have post-translation. So we're not going to talk about this, but there's, you have something called small interfering RNA, which are, are also involved in regulation, gene regulation. But you don't need to know it very level. You learn more about these in uni. This is uni level. Anyway, back to A level. <laughs> this is post-translation. So post-translation, we have here the ribosome. So this is translation happening. So this is the mRNA, the mature mRNA, mRNA is trans transcript. Here we have the ribosome. And then this is the protein being produced. And here within, after translation has occurred, the protein may be modified modification so it might have certain groups stuck to it so for instance we have po4 groups po4 minus groups phosphate groups may be added uh yeah many many enzymes are activated by phosphorylation But yeah, that's all you need to know about gene regulation. About gene regulation. So, now we've talked about this and we've talked about mutations. Now we're going to talk about genetic control of body plan development. Actually, there's a bit more of the stuff here as I find the one. So we have chromosome mutations as well so let me find it it's not in the textbook but actually i think it might be let me just double check where you go let me just double check where you said it's found nope okay so we're not we're not going to go over this uh genetic thing so this so here in fact, is an example of a triple. Whoops, is a triple nucleus. I repeat. So just to emphasize, this is a triple nucleus. I repeat, and that can cause Huntington's. And this example here is Huntington's disease. So this is a triple C A G C A G C A G C A G C A Z, so on, so on, so on, so on. And it can affect to make a really weird protein, which can lead to Huntington's disease. And then here we have certain chromosome mutations. So this one is non distransion So we have non disjunction where during meiosis, the cell where during meiosis, it's really good to explain. Non disjunction, which is where um, you have different numbers of chromosomes in each cell. So here during mitosis, we have like 2n, and then here we have going to n, and let's have 4n here, and then 2n. 2n and then here it can be n or and then 2n n and 2n 2n or whatever 
but this normally goes in range where there is an odd number so the chromosomes don't separate evenly within the cells so here's a good example which is down syndrome where you have three chromosome 21s so down syndrome is a good example of i think this is non dysfunction and that can lead to many mental disabilities down syndrome Okay, so now we're moving on to the control of body plan development. Okay, so now we're going to look at body plan development. So body development, there are certain series of genes which control where the different parts of a body is, how the body should build itself in an embryo. And there are certain gene sequences that help do this. So these are called homeobox genes, homeobox sequences. So homeobox sequence, homeobox sequence, is there are usually 180 base pairs, long and these are regulated these regulate anatomical development anatomical development in both animals plants and in fungi so basically all you can be apart from having protop protoptista. Excuse me. And then con and then these ones are found each homeobot sequence is a stretch of one hundred and eighty DNA best pairs. And this in this remote this is not included in the introns, by the way. And this encodes a 60 amino acid sequence, 60 amino alpha alpha acid alpha alpha sequence. And this is called the homeodomain. So you can see an example here. So this is the homeobox sequence. And then this protein is called a homeodomain. This set of is called a homeodomain. And these proteins are so the homeodomain sequence can fold into a particular shape and then it can act within the cell nucleus. And then these are basically transcription factors. And these contain some these contain something called a HTH, so it's a helix turn helix. So it's two alpha helices connected by one turn. Now, back to this. So we also have within the homeobox sequence, homeobox set of genes, we have something called ox genes. And these are basically homeobot sequences, but these are only found in animals. So hot genes are a subset of homeobot genes, but they are found only in animals. And these are involved in formation of anatomical features in correct location of body plan. I'm just holding the mic up close to me in case you can't hear me. <laughs> I might just do this. Anyway, hot genes were first discovered in the African clawed frog. You don't need to know this, but it's in the textbook called Xenopus. And this was in 1984, where Edward de Robertis discovered these hot genes in the frog. And so molecular and also 
these costumes are said to be conserved. These are said to be conserved. And conserved means they have found, they have remained in all descendant species throughout evolutionary history. So, in fact, these are conserved throughout all animals. So, from human to, in this example, fruit fly to elephants to birds, even to even to chickens, pigs, horses, all animals, you find the same. All genes are the same. All hot genes, in fact, are the same. So they are conserved in every animal. So let's look at how hot genes control body plan development in animals. So the hot genes regulate the development of embryos along the anterior, posterior, the head tail axis. So if we look at this fruit fly here, so this area here, is the head area, this is the head region, and then this here is the tail, the posterior region. So if these hot genes, so there is some scientists, and they are working out what happens if these hot genes are mutated, are mutated. so if hot genes are mutated, the hot genes in fruit flies, because fruit flies are very useful in studying genetics, when hot genes within fruit flies were mutated, they found that abnormalities can occur. So, for example, it's a really weird example that they give in the textbook. They have the drosophila. In the head of drosophila, instead of the antenna, you get leads on the head of the drosophila. And there's a really gross image in the textbook showing you what that looks like. It's weird. But it shows how crucial these hot screens are. So, so, let's carry on. I need to add it up it up. So let's carry on. Okay, so here we have a fruit fly here. And then this is the head side and this is the tail side. And you can see different regions, different genes, different hot genes correspond to where within the cells are activated and then they divert the cells within the embryo about where to go within the embryo. So for instance, this red gene, all the cells that have this gene tran active, they transcribe, will move to the back. Similarly, these genes, these cells will move and form this green section of the body, these pink ones will form, I don't have pink, the pink se section of the body, these light blue, these cells, the cells that are in this gene will form the front body, let's say, the front body of the fly. These orange cells, when they are expressing these orange genes, this orange gene, they will form the front ledge. And then these dark green will form, is that the mouth? I think that's the mouth. And so on. You can have these pink ones will correspond with these pink backlets and this section, these light blue genes, this light blue genes, the cells with these light blue genes will go on to form this section along with these leads down there. This orange gene, cells expressing this orange gene will, it's, will migrate towards to form these front leads. The yellow cells expressing the yellow gene will form the front part of the head, and the cells expressing this dark greenish gene will go on to form the mouth. So it's like these genes. So where, where, which, whatever cells these genes are being expressed, those cells would then migrate to what occurs according to these genes. So these genes basically tell cells where to go. Basically, so now how are so now we're going to talk about what happens when things go wrong. So that's apoptosis. So in nineteen sixty five, you don't need to know the history. Person here, 
if you want it. In 1965, JFRK, I'm just abbreviating it. It's on screen now. JFRK, the person, re-examined and researched the idea of programmed cell death. And this is now what we now know today as apoptosis. This was new for, and the term apoptosis in 1972 was used for programmed cell death. And it follows as there's a set of sequence of events. A set of sequ there's a sequence of events that occurs during apoptosis. So first thing to do, so the first thing that happens during apoptosis is that the enzymes, they are enzymes which break down the cell cytoskeleton. So here we have the nucleus. So the first thing that happens is enzymes digest cytoskeleton. So in this one, we have the cytoskeleton. So this is a normal healthy cell. This is actually a normal healthy cell. But the first thing that happens is that the enzymes digest or degrade or break down the cell cytoskeleton. This time, the second one, the cytoplasm becomes dense. And then you have tightly packed organelles, tightly packed organelles. The third one, the third thing that happens is that the side, the cell surface membrane changes and small protrusion called blebs, which are these things here, blebs, form. So blebs form. And at the same time, the chromatin condenses and chromatin condenses, which is seen here. So the chromatin is starting to become visible and condenses. And then you get blebs forming here. So here you have the cell membrane going all what kind of weird shape like because of these weird protrusions called blebs. And then the next thing that happens is that the cell breaks down into vesicles. So vesicles, cell breaks into vesicles. Vesicles that are ingested by phagocytes. So these cells here, which are these cells, so this is a phagocyte. And you can see it's ingesting this vesicle here. So this is a vesicle, actually the same vesicle here, and then this here is nuclear, these are nucleus, these are fragments of the nucleus. Now you have now apoptosis in, is crucial in remove in separating, for example, fingers and toes. So you can see here in this small picture here, you can see I think this is a this is a mouse embryo. That as you as you as the embryo develops, they have apoptosis happening. So before it's like a little webbed webbed feet. So you can see here. We have like web feet, and then over time, as the embryo develops, the apoptosis happens to separate the fingers or the digits between. The same, the same thing also happens in humans. So you go from looking like, how do I do it? Like this sort of. I don't know how you. I'm gonna try and draw. So you go from this. Sort of. It so it goes from like this to like proper distinct. So 
So these here, you have apoptosis happening. So these cells are basically dying, are undergoing programmed cell death, which is apoptosis. So these cells will be going. And then they will form proper gaps in between the digits. So this happens in mouse embryos, but it also happens in the human embryo to separate the fingers and toes. In fact, if you have income, if you have not enough apoptosis, this can lead to formation of tumors within the cell. And if you have too much apoptosis, this can lead to cell loss and degeneration. So, so, so basically, apoptosis removes, in effect, can in. So during limb development, which is shown here, apoptosis causes the digits to separate from each other, and if that doesn't happen, then you have incomplete se separation of. In the example they gave us, two toes, incomplete se separation of two toes, which is called syndactyly. I don't know how you pronounce that, due to the lack of apoptosis. So that's it. And that is it for this module. So this is, that was module 6. Which is so important. Thank you so much for watching. And I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.